our quarterly briefing for Q2 of 2018 for um, UPortal. Uh, our team um, is myself, Allison Dubose. We've got Drew Will, Benito, Chris Beach, Christian Murphy. Um, and um, I know for some of you that have been working with us, we've added a few people that are kind of pinch hitting that aren't that aren't shown on the slide here, but we do have some other resources pinch hitting as we need them. <laughs> All right, housekeeping. Uh, please keep your phones on mute. We do encourage questions, but please post those in the chat room. We will be monitoring that. If we can't answer a question, we'll follow up accordingly. Uh, this briefing will be available on the Unicon YouTube channel. Um, there will be a blog posted on the Unicon public website. And as always, let's have fun and learn a little bit. All right, so for the agenda, um, hopefully you saw the email that went out um, outlining this agenda. But again, we'll start with the UPortal community news. We are going to do a community spotlight preview. Um, initially, we were hoping to do the community spotlight today. But unfortunately, um, Foothills had a conflict and was not able uh, to do that today. So they're going to do the actual spotlight next quarter, but we are going to be at least preview it and kind of show you a little bit about it. Um, and then we'll do some talk about web based web component based content. We'll give a sustaining engineering update and then we'll do a Q&A and conversation at the end. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. Is it Drew that's doing the you? I think mostly Benito. OK, uh, Benito, let me. See if I can unmute you, or hopefully you can unmute yourself. Yep. Good morning. Perfect. Hi, folks. How's it going? Um, so you pretty back. Ah, you portal community news. We're going to start with uh, talking about our next dev days. We'll talk about the U portal annual report. Just some highlights from that, and of course that the U portal five two is coming soon, and, and Joel will tackle that topic. Next slide. All right, so we had a blast last time. It was December 2017 when we had our UPortal Dev Days in Madison, Wisconsin. Great time, a lot of things happened. We made some progress. It was great seeing everyone, so we're gonna do it again. This time we're gonna do it in Arizona, at Gilbert, at the Unicon offices. Uh, we were kind of looking at the dates, um, January 29th through the 31st. That's a Tuesday through Thursday. Um, I think that would work for everyone who's kind of uh, piped in on the e email uh, that I sent out to the mailing list. Uh, it, it should fall before most spring semesters start with camp, uh, for campuses. Um, so hopefully uh, that works for everyone. That's our target date unless we hear otherwise. Uh, and we'll certainly firm it up here in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so yeah, exciting. It's a, a great event. Uh, casual in the sense that we don't have uh, presentations um, that are formally given. There are presentations, but it's a lot of discussion and talking about topics that interest uh, you. Um, hope to see you there. Uh, next slide. All right, talking about the ePortal annual report now. This was um, presented to the community for review from the ePortal steering committee. Um, and this is something that we send up to uh, the board at Perio. But it's also a, a great time to reflect on the happenings of the previous year. So in this case, the report covered activity from 2017, May 2017, through uh, the end of April of this year. Um, and here are some of the highlights. Uh, we had a lot of growth. There was a new UPortal uh, ecosystem intake process. It's sort of like incubation light that's specific for UPortal. Uh, it, it, it's a much faster process. I'm involved with a period incubation and there's uh, more checkboxes when you go through that, uh, that procedure or that process such um, that it can be a little challenging. UPortal Home, actually went through the full Aperio incubation and has graduated just before open Aperio, but other projects can go through the intake process and it should be uh, a lot faster. We currently have about four in that pipeline. An interesting thing as well is how much activity is happening in the projects in uPortal. 
uh, there's been almost 100 releases on the various uh, projects, uPortal and Portlets. In particular with uPortal, there's been 22 releases. Um, and of course, uPortal 5, that was a big one. It falls in this time frame. It, huge changes. Um, we've been talking about that for what, two years now. And um, boy, it's, it's, it's great. And it's great to see so many uh, institutions jumping on the uPortal 5 uh, bandwagon. So that's exciting. Uh, moving on to participation, we've got um, several new contributors and a new committer, and it's just great seeing new faces. Some of those people will drift in, do a couple of commits, and then drift out, and that's great, but we love to see people come in and stick around. Uh, you know, people who've been part of the community who finally uh, dip their toes into some pull requests, that's fantastic, and that's what we'd love to see. Um, and, you know, a lot of other things, lots of presentations and some meetups and you know, going back to dev days, we're excited about that. Uh, and then kind of the last thing highlighted in the overview is financial responsibility. We currently have, and by, by we, I mean the U-Portal Steering Committee and the Imperial Foundation has three sustaining subscribers uh, with recurring revenue of about 26000 uh, and, and a fund balance. This is not Unicon. This is money that goes to the foundation that's uh, spent by the, or managed by the steering committee for uPortal. Um, just wanna make sure that's a distinction that's understood. Next slide. So there's a lot of good stuff in there, um, but um, I certainly wanted to highlight the challenges that were documented in that report. This isn't all of them, but it's a, it's a good uh, chunk of those. In particular, the first one, uPortal, is too difficult to adopt. uPortal 5 has made strides to make that so much easier. And as someone who, who switches back and forth between uPortal and, and uh, 4 and 5, um, boy, do I love going back to 5 and, and <laughs> do not enjoy going to uPortal 4 installations to work on. It, it, it's, things are a lot easier in uPortal 5. But there's still room for improvement. Um, and so that was highlighted. Uh, another item was that uPortal is not available, uh, you know, as a SaaS. Um, this is something Unicon in particular is interested in. Uh, we've certainly heard some positive things about that and some people interested in that. Um, not quite, quite ready yet to make that a reality, but if you or your institution or someone you know is really interested in having uPortal hosted, please contact, uh, contact one of us on the team or sales um, to let us know that you have some real interest in, in that offering, and we certainly could uh, push to make that happen. It's not that it's far off, it's just we certainly need um, a lot of interest in that before it, it happens. Um, <clears throat> Uportal is not widely known. Outside of higher ed, uh, Uportal, it seems, uh, doesn't have a lot of presence. Um, so to extend adoption, um, uh, this, this lack of notoriety and, and understanding of what uPortal is is, is, a, is a challenge. And of course, one of my favorites, moving on to the next one, is documentation. Um, there's been a lot of activity when it comes to documentation, um, but it's been in spurts. Uh, we've seen a lot of people contribute to that. One of the things that I've seen is uh, a slow migration of, of documentation from the previous Confluence installation into the GitHub repos. So that's exciting, it's great to see that continuing. Another challenge is what does uPortal become beyond JSR 286? Uh, there's a couple of uh, you know efforts to go with soffits. Um, change the front end from just your standard layout to something more interesting like Angular or React front ends, and certainly a greater focus on APIs. And uh, De Anza, for example, has a portal that's, that has no portlets in it whatsoever. So there's, there's some hope there, but it's still kind of the early days, so it's a challenge to see you know, who's going to win, what are, what are the, the approaches that are going to be the winners, and where the portal will be in the next year or two. 
And kind of the last thing that I've run into personally is CVEs are a challenge to acquire. Uh, this has to do with uh, vulnerabilities that are discovered and then broadcast uh, and shared with the community. Um, something I was working on that was a vulnerability, uh, I put in a request for a CVE with an open source uh, group and it took them well over a month to review it. And when they reviewed it, they thought, nope, this isn't really a vulnerability. <clears throat> Um, so to challenge that, the, you know, the, the vulnerability that I was working on was, was fixed. Uh, Drew fixed it, and it was rolled out and wasn't a big issue because um, it was for versions that hadn't been widely adopted quite yet. And, you know, the CVE process was still ongoing and still ongoing, and it's been months. So CVEs really are a challenge. <coughs> Next slide. So the report kind of wraps up with calls to action, and um, this is an important piece. So if you if you get a chance, uh, look through the mailing list, find the report, glance over it if you have the time or inclination. Um, but here's some of the calls to action that I'm excited about. Engage on the lists. Uh, you know, anything more than uh, um, me too, or I don't I don't know <laughs> would be great. Um, actually, a me too would be fine if you see an issue that someone else brings up and you say, yeah, we face that as well and we don't have an answer. Just knowing that um, other people are facing things is great. Uh, commenting on how uh, you might have resolved an issue if you see something online. Just and any engagements on the list really helps to uh, bring our community to life. Enhance uh, documentation, contribute a fix, or add a feature. Um, you know, the add a feature or contribute a fix, those are, are kind of technically oriented efforts, but that documentation, and, and even if you don't actually write the documentation, certainly let us know. Uh, there's been several times working on a, on a project or through Zendesk tickets where uh, someone has said, hey, I, I tried to look for this, the documentation is out of date or it doesn't exist, can you help me? And yeah, and part of that uh, exchange will include uh, myself or someone else uh, on our team writing the documentation uh, to detail what's going on and sharing that through the ticket. Um, so that's a great way to keep that documentation moving forward. But if you want to just do some updating to the documentation, uh, that would be fantastic. So the more we have people contributing to that effort, uh, the faster we get our documentation up to date. <clears throat> Uh, another call to action is to propose a new sub-project that's related to uPortal. Um, get on the mailing list once you get a project started and just say, hey, I'd, I'd like to contribute this to the uPortal ecosystem and, you know, someone will pick it up and we'll start uh, the, the intake process. Or maybe you just want to contribute it and, well, that's really the first step, right? Contribute it to uh, the uPortal group and we'll, we'll see uh, how much interest we can drum up and, and get that moving. Um, <clears throat> another item is to become an Aperio member if you're not, that's the Aperio Foundation, um, to help finance Open Aperio and all the effort and support that goes into maintaining these projects in the foundation itself. Another um, thing to consider is becoming a uPortal support subscriber. Again, this helps um, fund uh, some of the costs that are associated with uPortal, uh, potentially getting a dedicated uh, uPortal support person um, that's funded by the foundation and directed by the steering committee, um, among other things. And then lastly, just to highlight, continue your Unicon open source support contracts. Uh, Drew, Christian, myself, yeah, our team has done a lot of work in uPortal, driven a lot of the efforts, um, and, and that is all a result of open source support. Um, it's, it's those hours that we have uh, that help us enhance the project that really have kept things moving, clipping along at such a, a great rate. Um, you know, other games are, are, are fantastic as well, but that open source support really, to me, has a huge impact. Um, on, on the, you know, sustaining and improving the uPortal ecosystem. Next slide. So that's kind of it for the uh, 
prepare a report. And I'll hand this over to Drew to talk about the 5.2 release. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to have a 5.2 release pretty soon. The we've we've had U Portal 5 releases at a great pace. Uh, I've certainly been happy with the pace, and I've heard a lot of other folks say that the frequency with which we are um, you know putting out releases is really good, uh, very satisfying. That's great. I think it is. Uh, our kind of loose expectation is that uh, we could have a minor release, uh, you know, and our next minor release is 5.2. Have a minor release uh, about once a quarter or maybe three times a year. Uh, we're about due for that. We do have some new things uh, in Master that have not gone into uh, nor will go into UPortal 5.1. Uh, not a ton of new things. They are mostly uh, updates, enhancements to uh, existing APIs, uh, REST-based APIs, uh, and and that is nice or significant because it ties in with the thing that is really the big story these days for uh, sort of ongoing. Uh, U portal development, and that is in the front end. It's uh, web components, new content uh, based on web components. The API enhancements that we are uh, preparing uh, for new versions of U portal uh, are they're being done in order to facilitate those efforts of, of developing newer, better, uh, better sexier, uh, non portlet uh, content for U portal. And that is, in fact, uh, the next section. So uh, talking about 5.2 is kind of a good way to segue into that, I guess. Uh, we can give it to Christian. Thanks much. Uh, so speaking towards web component content, as Drew mentioned, this is kind of one of the approaches that we're looking at for possibly replacing JSR 286, of um, being able to um, render components in the front end. And um, we just kind of wanted to show off a few of the ways that um, both Unicon and the community have been starting to leverage this new front-end rendering paradigm um, with some examples. Um, so the first one is the notification um, icon, um, which was a collaboration between Cal Poly Pomona and Unicon. Um, this replaced the existing bell icon with a new one that when you click on it has a drop down with the preview of um, some of the different notifications that are waiting. Um, this kind of avoids the having to go to a new page to see what's new um, going on in the portal. And it was made possible by having um, the web component paradigm there so we can load those um, individual notifications in the main portal view without needing to do any uh, weird data manipulation or hack at uh, the software end. Um, if you're interested in that, um, when we send out the slide deck, at the bottom of each of these slides, we have the link um, to see each of these components. Um, so absolutely do check them out. Um, so the next component is the or, uh, notification modal. Sorry, um, This one is a collaboration between uh, Oakland University and Unicon. Um, whenever a person first um, reaches the portal, um, if there are any notifications, um, I think we're currently doing it mostly with high priority notifications, like um, confirming um, the terms of service for visiting the site. Um, we can pop that up in a modal that um, a user has to confirm before going through. Or if we just want more informational information to pop up, like um, here's what changed in the site recently, um, we can pop up a modal that is easily dismissible and it can come back um, given on a certain time span. Um, but, uh, another pretty cool one, which is again with Cal Poly Pomona, is a waffle menu. Um, many of you have seen kind of the app launcher style designs that have been coming through on the list and uh, been being talked about more lately. This brings that app launcher um, style design to the menu. Um, at the top, um, very similar to how Google currently does their application links out of just um, click on that menu. It has a list of services that you can visit. Um, and if it's not on that quick and easy list, um, a link below will take you out to a complete list of all the services which the university provides. 
Um, another one coming out is um, a browse carousel. Um, this is, again, kind of ties in with that whole app launcher idea. Um, this is currently using placeholder images, but these um, are designed to be app launchers. Um, so each of those would be click on one of them and it'll jump straight out to a service. And a large number of services can be listed in the carousel um, to kind of make it easier to browse through and discover um, new content in the portal. Um, tying into that a bit more, there's a second aspect to this, the uh, hero carousel. Um, so if you want to display like a hero image about exciting news on campus um, or um, major like portlets that you want displayed in kind of an area below, um, the same paradigm or the same um, design aspect, the carousel that was used for the app launchers can be used on this um, hero type image on the page, um, letting people scroll through that and find out what's going on on campus. Um, and then coming out of France, we also have a couple new designs there. This is Content um, Grid from Gip Resia. Julian has been working on this one. Um, it's again a partially um, carousel based design. Um, this is actually about five components put together into a page. Um, so there's the individual app icons, there's the favorites icon in the corner of each of those, the all services at the bottom is a component, and then the favorites at the top is another component. Um, how this works is the all services is just a list of every single piece of content that a user can access in the portal. Um, and if they want to add that to their favorites list, they just click that star and it's automatically added up to the favorites. And that favorites persists um, from page to page in the header um, throughout the portal. So there's always easy access to get to those um, various uh, favorite content aspects in the portal. Um, and this one is from Sorbonne University. Um, Christian C. from France designed this. Um, this is a new, I believe it's designed to be more of a portlet um, for viewing content. Um, it has a nice uh, material design to it, um, has a drop down that has some additional settings. And another important aspect is this demonstrates um, internationalization. So if you go in the portal and switch the language, all of the content on this page will switch to the language um, that the portal is currently in. So it's able to handle full internationalization and is designed to be very accessible as well. Um, so that is um, all the kind of um, uPortal specific ones. I'll hand it off to Drew to talk about a new um, and very exciting component called Form Builder, um, which will have a more generic use case. Take it away, Drew. <laughs> yes, yes, I will take it away. Uh, all right, so uh, this um, this is the last one of these uh, web components in this series, in this section. Uh, I'm gonna take this one. Uh, I've been working on this one, uh, you know, not alone, but uh, I have been working on it personally. Uh, I really, uh, you'll see, I, I believe you'll see a lot of this in the coming months because uh, my hope, our hope is to make a really big deal about this uh, because um, this component, it's, it's not merely a web component, it's, it's a whole new, it's sort of a brand new module for uPortal, uh, not enhancements, uh, or fixes to existing capabilities. This is a whole new constellation of abilities for you portal of capabilities uh, And we love to do that kind of thing. We don't get the chance to do it every month uh, You know, there's one or two of these a year where we get to sit down and tackle uh, You know a very significant scope of new stuff for you portal and when that happens uh, we want it to be a big success and we want to make a lot of noise about it uh, so you can consider this to be sort of the beginning of that uh, I have signed up for I've committed to doing a, um, a perio series webinar in September uh, on web components uh, generally but especially about this module for you portal uh, so you'll hear about it there if you attend. You'll see uh, information on list, and there will certainly be 
content on this in the uh, winter meetup as well as the conference next year. Uh, so I think most folks will be, uh, you know, at least uh, conversationally familiar with what a, a form builder, a web form builder is, uh, it, you know, what type, what category of thing that is. Uh, well, we have one now for uPortal. We have a component that allows you to actually, can you give me the next slide? I think it's on this. Excellent. Uh, with this component, it's actually two components. I should mention uh, Form Builder is the front end, uh, and we're developing the front end separate in a separate Git repo from the back end. The back end is called FBMS. It stands for Form Builder Microservice. Uh, we're developing these in two separate repos. However, uh, the the first one, Form Builder, it releases as a web jar. It's available in uh, the Node uh, repositories. What would you call that? Node, NPM, Node Package Manager. Uh, it's available there. It's also available as a web jar in uh, Maven Central. Uh, FBMS uh, con consumes the web jar, the Form Builder web jar, as a Maven dependency. And so if you, if you bundle FBMS into your uPortal, in the uPortal start, you get the whole solution just through that. Uh, together, these two um, technologies, front end, back end, they allow you to create custom web forms to, to display and consume in the portal. Uh, you can create them without Java, HTML, JavaScript, or CSS coding at all. Uh, you just define them, and the technology, the engine, renders them for you. It captures user input. It um, can display previous users' selections, you know, the users' previous selections in the form when the user goes back to the form. Uh, you can publish and update forms for your uPortal using FBMS and Form Builder uh, without rebuilding or redeploying uPortal. Uh, but in addition to uh, just having forms in the portal, you can extend FBMS, uh, you know, probably most significantly for the purpose of integrating FBMS with other, uh, other campus systems uh, by implementing custom extension filter beans. It's, a, it's an interface that you uh, implement in Java in order to integrate with other uh, systems or to do other things with the data that users submit beyond what the solution does by default. Uh, you can create a sophisticated workflow by chaining uh, more, multiple forms or multiple form pages together. Uh, the FBMS solution includes uh, API documentation and a, a, a simple REST client based on Swagger. And FBMS uh, supports uPortal import export. It can you can bundle, and I think we'll be doing this by default in uh, uPortal Start before too long. You can bundle FBMS uh, into your portal, and you can integrate forms into uh, the import export process, so that when you uh, you know in, initialize. A U portal, it shows up right away with forms ready to ready to use. Uh, so it is intended to be uh, a generic, uh, feature rich, extensible uh, form builder solution for U portal. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, all right, so here on this slide, I've gathered a bunch of logos for stuff we use to build. Uh, form Builder and FBMS. I've mixed it all together, front end and back end. So Bruce had a question a little bit ago, uh, what is needed to create a web component? And I think this slide, it, it hints at the answer to that, and this is probably the place where I should um, pause for a moment and attempt to answer that. Uh, we are building web components uh, not in Java at all. Uh, we're, we're building web components uh, not with, um, you know, Spring MVC or with JSPs or with or with something like Timeleaf. We are building web components uh, 
without the concept of server-side rendering, you know, nothing in the HTML, the JavaScript, or the CSS is dynamically rendered uh, server-side whatsoever. We're building um, web components uh, using Node and using a, a, a slew of Node modules and Node-based technologies, so a whole an, an entire sort of front-end development stack for web components. And frankly, I'm not sure if it's feasible to do it any other way. Feasible in a, um, you know, fundamentally feasible. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you can write assembly language if you want to. At the end of the day, I suppose you could write, uh, you know, enough JavaScript or, or whatever custom uh, to produce a web component. But I, I don't think it is tactically feasible to produce web components without using uh, Node and, and Node modules. So let me mention some of the ones that appear on this slide. I do have the logo for Node.js itself. Uh, we are using, when we build web components, we are, we are always using either React.js or Vue.js. It is also possible to use Angular uh, to build web components. Uh, at Unicom, we're not doing it, but it is uh, completely feasible to be done in Angular. Uh, we are using quite modern versions of JavaScript. I have uh, a logo for ES6 here for ECMAScript, uh, you know, uh, here that Christian gave me some grief about because apparently the technically the uh, version of JavaScript that we are using uh, these days is, is actually ES9. They don't have a, a fancy ES9 logo, so I stuck with this one. Yeah, he, he talked about flipping the whole thing over, but then it would be um, S backwards E. <laughs> All right, so we're using so, um, hypermodern versions of JavaScript, and uh, we're using JavaScript that is so modern that almost no browser is supported entirely. Uh, and that's where this next component comes in. It's called Babel. Uh, Babel is a, a module for Node. It's a Node-based technology that uh, transpiles your JavaScript. You write your JavaScript exactly as you want to uh, and you know, read between the lines that the way you want to do it is using the most modern versions. Uh, you write extremely modern JavaScript and Babel can transpile uh, you know, just like compiling in Java, Babel can can translate that hypermodern JavaScript into uh, JavaScript that uh, all browsers uh, can understand. Babel, the Babel component is knowledgeable about what language features each browser supports. It tracks that stuff. There's an internal, you know, sort of database and matrix, and it does matching, uh, matching in significant part based on uh, what browser versions you say you want to target. So when you configure Babel, you tell it what browsers you're targeting and Babel will transpile all your JavaScript into something that those, uh, that those browsers will understand. Uh, also similar to Babel and, and just to the left on this slide, there's a logo without a name. Uh, that is the logo for Webpack. Uh, Webpack is this really amazing uh, node module that knows how to take uh, a mountain of stuff, uh, several JavaScript files, uh, you know, several uh, CSS files, even things like Im images, SVGs, and so forth. And it knows how to um, package all of those things, you know, kind of distill all of those things and package them into a single JS file so that it's amazingly easy to bring a, uh, a web component onto the page. Oh, I didn't put uh, an example of bringing a web component onto the page in the slides. Maybe I'll do that next time. That would be handy to see. I did a bunch of that at the conference for those of you at the conference. Uh, so Babel and Webpack are these amazing, um, you know, node modules that do a lot of the complicated work uh, for for building and packaging 
uh, web components. Uh, the other front end, uh, so between Spring Security and ES6 is the logo for web components itself, just below the initials FBMS. The other sort of front end uh, element on this page, it's actually both a front end and back end, is OpenID Connect, logo top right, OpenID Connect is essentially the protocol that we are using to get front and back ends uh, talking together. Uh, OpenID Connect, uh, it's a specification, it defines a thing called a, an OpenID Connect ID token. Uportal uh, 5.1 and above is capable of producing one of these OpenID Connect ID tokens. It's a, uh, a JWT or a JWT, a JSON web token. It is uh, signed by the portal server uh, and can therefore be you know, accepted and trusted in web components uh, and in other contexts, in, in REST APIs. Uh, it is, the, the JWT contains uh, what are called uh, standard claims. These are defined by the uh, OpenID Connect specification, the standard claims, and it can also uh, contain custom claims that you define. Uh, and one of the custom claims that it, that it always contains is uh, it has a custom claim, the one that uPortal produces has a custom claim for groups. So your ID token will contain some information about the groups that you belong to, and we can share that with uh, the front end or with REST APIs that don't operate in the portal at all. Then on this slide, there are some logos for backend uh, technologies that we use in FBMS, like Spring Boot and Spring Security. We also use Hibernate. Uh, we use Spring Data JPA uh, in FBMS. So in uh, both in front end and back end with the form builder and FBMS solution, we have sort of leapfrogged ourselves into uh, you know, the present moment of the, um, you know, sort of Java web development industry. Uh, we, we are squarely sort of both feet in uh, 2018 with these uh, solutions. What's on the next slide? I forget. Ah, yes. So I say you don't need uh, code, Java code or HTML, CSS, uh, to define a, a new form for uh, uPortal, uh, a new form in FBMS and Form Builder. Uh, the, the language that this solution speaks is called JSON schema. Uh, JSON schema is for JSON exactly what XML schema, essentially what XML schema is for XML. It's a language uh, that allows you to define uh, and kind of constrict uh, JSON documents. So if you define some JSON schema and you import it into FBMS, then the uPortal uh, ecosystem form builder solution uh, that I've been talking about uh, can take that JSON schema and render a form for you so you see, like I took, I took a very short one here, uh, so it would fit on the slide nicely. Uh, mobile number validation, the system detected that your primary cell number has changed. Uh, it, it says it wants a validation code. The validation code is a string. Can you uh, up arrow like three slides and go back to the screenshots? Oh, let's Just see. left arrow or something. Yep, here we go. One more, two more, that one. Uh, that JSON schema produces the form in the kind of lower right, on the right-hand side, in this slide. Uh, so if you can define JSON schema like that, it can be in your portal, as you see on this slide, and it can uh, capture user input, uh, it can uh, depending on your wishes, it can redisplay uh, the user input when the user goes to update the form again. It, you know, altogether these components allow you, this solution allows you to bring uh, arbitrary custom forms into the portal. Uh, 
Uh, that may be my last slide. Let's go back to that. I believe it was. I believe it is. And we're using all kinds of times, so that's probably. Yeah, I was just going to do a time check. So we've got yeah. about 17 minutes left, just as a heads up for those that are finishing out the uh, presentation. I am, <laughs> let, let me just say in um, closing that I'm a little bit shocked there haven't been uh, questions in the chat. Uh, please don't hesitate uh, to ask them. Uh, uh, the, the time is ripe. Uh, there are releases of both Form Builder and FBMS available uh, in Maven Central. Uh, the time to check these things out uh, and potentially use them is upon us. They're not things that we're working on for the future. They're here today. I'm, I'm currently busy uh, implementing uh, you know, this solution for State Center Community College District in California, it's uh, ready to be a part of your portal uh, as soon as you have a use for it. All right. Thanks, Drew. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit on what we've been doing for sustaining engineering this past quarter. Um, so some big updates. We have moved our issue tracking to GitHub issues. Um, so if you run into issues or would like to request a feature, um, go ahead and lock that either on the GitHub issue tracker or in Zendesk. Uh, we have um, four new web components that are rolled into uPortal and more in the works. Um, those are the same ones that we demoed earlier. Um, we've had quite a few releases. Um, just around the core project itself, there have been seven uPortal releases, four portlet releases, and 16 web component releases. Um, so a lot of code getting released out there, um, a lot of new things to try out. Uh, we've merged 225 pull requests across the uPortal ecosystem and have used um, 251.75 uh, sustaining engineering hours this quarter um, to help make that effort possible. So again, a big thank you to our um, sustaining engineering subscribers for helping to make that possible. Um, so on the release train, um, in uPortal land, we have had um, uPortal um, 5.0 has had a couple patch releases. uPortal 5.1 has now gone uh, stable with some new features. We'll talk about that in a second. And we've had a couple additional patches to 5.1 to help um, smooth things out and resolve um, some minor bugs. Um, we've also had uPortal web components had 16 releases. It's gone from um, a pre-release all the way up to um, 131, which is the current version available out there. Um, those web components include an OpenID Connect helper, um, so you can use that inside of web components to automatically uh, grab the OpenID Connect token, and it also um, parses that token into JSON that can be used um, throughout the front end to recognize groups, which users currently active, uh, all the different information that's contained in that token is in a nice, usable format. Um, we've also had updates to the notification portlet, which brought in the um, notification icon, the dropdown that we demoed earlier. Um, we've also had updates to the simple content portlet, announcements portlet, and spring portlet contrib, um, which are all available in Maven Central. And uPortal 5.2 is coming soon. Um, so talking again towards uPortal 5.1, kind of a highlight of a few major things that came in. Um, one is the flexible layout. Um, so now, I believe it's enabled by default, um, the layout will automatically wrap after, I believe it's six elements are available on the page. Um, so um, it makes the um, portlet view a lot more accessible and a lot easier to follow along with. Um, and it handles the use case of dynamically adding and removing uh, portlets based off of role a lot easier to manage. Um, we also added in the OpenID Connect endpoint, which Drew has already talked about, um, as well as we improved the soffit data modeling um, so that um, the packet size will never exceed what a browser or a application server can handle. Um, so that resolved a few bugs that we ran into um, with handing a lot of data over to a soffit. Um, 5.1 also included some significant library updates. Um, that will not directly impact um, anything that you're seeing, um, but it has um, improved the performance of the server a bit um, behind the scenes. <laughs> 
Um, a preview of what's going to be going into uh, five to milestone one, um, at least what we know of so far. Um, we're adding in multi-value support for OpenID Connect claims. Um, so if you want to pass through, for example, an array of values in one of those claims, uh, that is now going to be supported. Uh, we're also including the Portlet publishing params as part of the layout APIs. Um, this was contributed and requested by Madison. Um, it should help empower some new use cases around um, uPortal Home and some of the uh, web component style layouts. And then um, the Portlet registry now supports filtering. Um, so this is going to be used around some of the carousels we demoed earlier and around the um, the waffle menu or the app launcher drop down. Um, this allows um, each of those to focus on just a specific category. Um, for example, um, on campus services or favorited portlets. Um, and we can just get that very focused list and use that in the UI instead of doing some advanced processing. And as usual, there's going to be some library updates and some more um, improvements and stability upgrades in 5.2. One more time. Oh, sorry. No oh, problem. <laughs> I was like, what's happening? Um, so, uh, a preview of the um, community spotlight. Before we do that, um, yes. can we mention quickly that there's going to be, we're organizing a, um, a call, like a Zoom community call around uh, web component development quite soon? Absolutely. Um, so, so far it's looking like maybe uh, next week. I think next Tuesday was looking pretty promising. Um, we're looking to do a, a uPortal community call around web components. Um, topics of discussion would be um, some of the opportunities and challenges which we've had with um, web components so far and doing some knowledge transfer around that. And then also looking for opportunities for the community to collaborate on um, continued development of web components. And, and to be clear, this is less of a facilitated thing. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, a show and tell and, and just kind of brainstorm together, kind of a, a birds of a feather. Absolutely. Thanks for the reminder on that, Drew. Yep. Um, um, and for the community spotlight, um, Drew, would you like to take it away? No, oh, sure. Why not? I wasn't expecting to, but, you know, I'm a fan. <laughs> uh, Foothill, De Anza Community College District, uh, they are a, um, a small collection of uh, schools in uh, California, kind of uh, near Silicon Valley. Uh, we've uh, been working with them and they've been working on their own uh, to implement uPortal 5. Uh, it's the first uPortal uh, for them. They're actually moving off of Luminous. Why don't you hit the next slide? They were on the, uh, you know, they're a banner school. They were on the Luminous portal. Uh, and they have some goals for, uh, you know, updating, refreshing their, their portal. Uh, they've selected uPortal. Uh, they've been very happy. Uh, it's, it's been a joy uh, to work with them, particularly Matt. He, we were going to do uh, a Foothill uh, Community Spotlight this quarter. The trouble is that their rollout date is, like, very, very soon. Uh, and they're really tied up with that uh, at the moment, so I think we're going to do it next quarter, but we included uh, sort of a little preview here. Can you hit the next slide? Uh, their uPortal uh, is entirely portlet free. It is built in, I'm pretty sure, React, uh, and using Node and Babel and Webpack and other, you know, fancy technologies. It, uh, interacts with uPortal exclusively through REST APIs, uh, but uPortal provides, you know, the data model and the data uh, and the persistence and, and all kinds of uh, other, you know, back-end logic. Uh, and, and they're very happy, and uh, Matt Rapsinski is going to come uh, on the call next time and tell you uh, a bunch about their portal. We also believe that he will be in attendance in the winter um, get together uh, that we talked about for January. That's a, uh, you know, that's not a promise, but that's uh, what we expect. Uh, and he's a great guy to meet. Uh, all right, uh, next slide. What else do we have? Nothing. That's it. <laughs> uh, more questions.
right. Yeah, it, you know, let's see. How will we know more about the Web Components Meetup? Uh, so, it, probably already by now there should have been content about that on the list. But there will be, I would expect, you know, today, tomorrow at the latest, uh, content on the list as far as organizing the time uh, for that call. Uh, but we do think it'll be next week. Uh, if it, um, if the call, you know, if one call is not enough, if there's a bunch of people who can't make it or we can't, uh, or we don't feel like we cover the ground we want to cover, we will organize another one, uh, you know, for a couple weeks later. Uh, will soffits continue to be supported long term? Well, uh, I would say definitely yes, but I need to qualify that. Uh, I think that uh, so the soffit technology that was introduced in uPortal 5, uh, it was it was all about producing content uh, for uPortal or having content for uPortal that was not portlet based. That was the driver uh, for putting that together, and that is the nature of uh, the software technology that is included in uPortal 5, starting with 5.0. Some of that, but not all of that software technology dealt with server-side rendering. Some of the software technology allowed you to uh, create a JSP uh, in a sort of a, a soffit module, typically built with Spring Boot, and that JSP that would render uh, in your module and the output of that JSP would appear in the portal page when it was loaded. Uh, I don't know for sure that there will be a future for that part of Soffit. Uh, Soffit at this point is focusing quite a bit less on uh, that server-side rendering and more on the web components uh, solution. Uh, the, the web components that we're building uh, you know, the ones in uh, Notification Portlet, both the, the modal and the uh, new icon that ha has the drop-down list, uh, the form builder, all of those have Soffit technology in them to integrate with uh, the security aspects of uPortal, the security and identity aspects of uPortal, and to consume that um, OpenID Connect token. So in my book, those are soffits, even though the uh, front ends are 100% web components. Uh, so the, you know, the picture there is a bit nuanced. Uh, yes, I think the soffit technology plays a significant role going forward, but we may do the UI, you know, the, the parts that run in the front end, we may do exclusively with JavaScript. Uh, the form builder has some sort of editor. It does not. That's a roadmap item. Yes. Um, there are some um, JSON schema building UIs out there. We have not integrated one into the form builder yet. Yeah, we don't have an editor, but we, uh, we have a Swagger client. So if you edit uh, JSON schema, you can upload it to the solution, you know, live on the server at any time. Uh, it's, you know, it's a missing feature. Ultimately, we need that. There's more uh, that we need as well. We need an auditing component. We need some kind of component that will allow you to browse uh, submissions by users and look at what they submitted. We don't have that either. Uh, at um, the current use cases that we're targeting with uh, the form builder are around integrations with other systems. So when a user submits, uh, you know, fills out a form and submits the form, that data, you know, through the use of extension filters, that data gets shuffled to other places. Uh, it gets fed to other systems in appropriate ways. And that's how we're using Form Builder this moment. But we need uh, an authoring tool and we need uh, an auditor or a viewer for submissions that have been made by users. Uh, we're trying to come up with some use cases for Form Builder. Excellent. Can you give some examples? Well, uh, the example, you know, the first example in the screenshot was um, communication preferences. Can you fill out your uh, cell phone number and email address, uh, whichever or both of those you want to give us? 
uh, the version that we have uh, that we're working on with State Center actually validates both of those. If you put in an email, it will send uh, a, a validation link uh, to the email address, and when you click on the link, it will validate, uh, you know, that the the link will that the link has been clicked, and, and it will write, you know, to a database somewhere that the email address is validated. If you put in a mobile phone number. It will send a validation code over SMS, uh, and uh, you know we have that part working perfectly fine at this point. It will present, uh, and then uPortal will present you with a uh, another form that allows you to enter the validation code for SMS. And then when you do, we write to a database, you know, the fact that you have a validated uh, mobile phone number. Uh, the form builder could and potentially should be used ultimately to replace the feedback portlet. Uh, where we can have, a, where we can gather a lot more flexible and customizable feedback uh, in the portal, uh, as well as sort of multiple kinds of feedback. We might have a workflow for uh, submitting feedback where you first say, you know, do I want to report a bug or do I want to, um, you know, just sort of make a comment or do I, you know, do I want to request some content in the portal or request a feature? Uh, we could do that with the form builder pretty easily. Uh, we we can use the form builder for general surveys or polls. Uh, we could use the form builder to uh, purchase uh, football tickets. Uh, we could use the form builder to register for graduation. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say to re register for courses or anything like that. Uh, you know, but there there are these like various one-off use cases that happen uh, in campus life uh, that potentially we could use the form builder for, uh, allow users to come in into the portal and um, uh, you know and sign up for something. We could we could use the form builder to sign up for a lecture series. Uh, we could use the form builder to gather feedback for a lecture series. Uh, all of these things are, you know, everything I just listed, relatively simple to do. I would say uh, I probably wouldn't look to Form Builder to replace things that other tools do as their sort of core competency. Uh, you, you know, that, for example, the registering for courses, you know, that's an SIS. Uh, SIS vendors spend millions of dollars developing user interfaces for registering for courses. I wouldn't dream of replacing that. Uh, and just emergency quick, contact info, yeah. And um, jumping in there really quick, um, I believe one of the IAM projects here at Unicon is also adopting JSON schema to do some form building, and they're doing it for um, configurable preferences pages. So the entire workflow for getting um, an IAM server set up is controlled through that. Um, it's not necessarily configurable by a user, but it's an easier way to manage um, having significant um, form inputs. So uh, Bruce asks, who makes the decision what front-end technologies uPortal will support, uh, you know, going forward? And that, of course, is contributors. Uh, it's not Unicon, and it's not the uh, steering committee even. It's, you know, it's the folks who contribute and maintain uh, the you know, the software uh, that does those things. I need to mention, uh, I need to make sure, I, I think this is pretty widely known, but uh, make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that uh, our days uh, supporting uh, portlets, you know, JSR 286 portlets, or even the next version of portlets, our days are, it would be very difficult to continue that indefinitely. Uh, we are under pressure to discontinue support for portlets, for Java portlets, because uh, Spring 5 removes it. So if we want to continue to be a Spring-based, uh, you know, to develop Java technology based on Spring, uh, if we want uPortal uh, to continue to be a sort of Spring-based Java application, uh, at some point, we will have to move to Spring 5, and when we do, we lose support uh, for the Portlet MVC, which has been the basis for all the Portlet development we've done for everything since the Web Proxy Portlet. It, it was Web Proxy Portlet version 1 was the 
only thing, only a perio portlet ever uh, developed without um, spring. Uh, I guess in ePortal itself, there are a number of framework portlets that use um, Webflow, Spring Webflow. We have not exactly been tremendously happy with that either, uh, Spring Webflow. So uh, we, will, we will not have the same legs to stand on for portlet development, the technology that we've counted on when we move to Spring 5. At a certain point, uh, Spring 4 will no longer be maintained or patched with security fixes. Uh, we have got to keep our eyes on some version of the portal uh, that is not uh, based on, where the content is not based on portals. Uh, we could continue to support server-side rendering in, soffit, in soffits indefinitely. It's not hard, and it could be made better. Uh, particularly if it's clear in the, you know, on the list and in the Aperio contributed modules, if it's clear that uh, it's popular, you know, that's uh, not a problem. And just a quick time check, we are about five minutes over time, so not to discourage additional questions, but just to, to uh, make everybody aware that apologies, we ran a little bit late but all good conversations. Any additional questions? You are always free and encouraged to uh, bring up uh, questions on the list as well. Uh, arguably, it's the best place for them, but we're happy to uh, have discussions here in real time too. Uh, we are... Um, Grateful to see all of you and for the lively conversation such as it was. Uh, there will be a uh, recording of this session available uh, on YouTube uh, and a blog, you know, covering highlights. There will be another one uh, next quarter. Uh, please uh, look into attending the winter meeting. Uh, it should be a blast in addition to very helpful. Uh, you know, the, the, the temperatures in January in Phoenix are, you know, let's just say attractive, yeah. typically. Yes, golf. That's <laughs> true. You can uh, actually golf here in January. <laughs> yeah, you can, well, you can golf here in January better than in August. Yes, that is true. <laughs> Ball flies more in the summer. Oh, here's someone that says the weather was not attractive back in 2014. Well, yeah, we had one awful, uh, for as long as I've lived here, I think the worst week uh, that I endured was one that we had people over to the Cal Poly uh, East Campus uh, for an unconference. That was miserable. <laughs> well, we'll try to do better than that. Oh, yeah. Year, then. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we'll uh, wrap it up then. We'll chat with everybody in all the normal ways that we chat with folks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.